Where we are in Matthew chapter 17 is a bit of a transition, sort of speak. Jesus has taken a few of his disciples up to the mountaintop. And man, did they have a mountaintop experience. Peter, James, and John likely hiking to the top of Mount uh, <clears throat> uh, top of the mountain, about nine, ten thousand feet. Uh, a lot of question in regards to the identity of the mountain, Mount Hermon. Some speculate could be, might not be. Anyway, regardless, Jesus, right in front of them, is transfigured. What was inside of him comes radiating out. Who he really is is demonstrated for them to see. And then they're joined by Moses, they're joined by Elijah. It is quite, quite a scene. You can go back into the archive, you can listen to the audio from not just this past Sunday, but the Sunday before, regarding the commentary of what occurs on the mountain. But, as with most mountaintop experiences, we don't live there. We don't stay there. As much as the disciples would have liked to, even suggesting they build some tents and camp out, they have to come down from the mountain. And they have to come into the valley. And we're told in verse 14, again Matthew 17, that when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him kneeling down to Jesus, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. It seems within the flow of the text that what is taking place has happened while Jesus was absent. Again, Jesus, Peter, James, and John on the top of the mountain. The other nine disciples, they're in the valley waiting, hanging out. As they wait, as they tarry, as they're waiting for Jesus to come back, they're, they're met with a particular need. This man in, in a crisis. His son, in fact, not just a son, the other passages, the other accounts of this text, of this story, indicate that this was the man's only begotten son. It was his only child. And his son is suffering in incredible ways. Now we're told here by Matthew that he is an epileptic. Now don't jump to the conclusion or, or make the connection that all epilepsy is evidence of demon possession. Uh, that would be a, a misinterpretation of the passage. In fact, it's a bit of a misinterpretation of the word itself. The word that we get here in the Greek for epilepsy, this epile epileptic, it's literally moonstruck. It's an interesting old school type term. There in the Greek to describe someone that's lunatic, someone that is clearly struggling with reality, struggling with their faculties. It's called, this boy's called an epileptic, but he's, he's nuts. What's the cause? Well, we're told in a few minutes that he's demon-possessed. Again, not all epilepsy can be rooted to demon possession, nor can all mental illness be linked in the same regards. But we know here unequivocally with this boy, his physical ailment is the direct repercussion of something happening internally. He is possessed, we know that. And as a result of this incredible possession, this difficult possession, he loses control of himself. In fact, the demon that's taken over his faculties is actively, it's implied by the text, trying to kill the boy. That he would go into these fits and he'd flop himself into the fire or into the water. Imagine this man having such a boy, trying to take care of him, trying to supervise him. How this man's heart ached how desperate he was, how frustrated. No doctors could provide remedies. No rabbi could provide a seance. This man stuck in a very difficult situation. The boy, no doubt, that he loves, a child that he cares about, this is his only son. How frustrating. And the man hears that Jesus is near, that Jesus is in town, and so he comes to the disciples Again, maybe it's all 12, probably more or less the nine. And he's wanting them to provide a remedy to heal his son, to cast out this demon. And yet, the way that the text unfolds is these men prove to be about worthless. 
This man brings his son to the disciples. He's desperate. He's like, please do something. And no matter what they try, no matter what technique they employ, no matter what they do, they fail. They fail to meet this man's need. They fail to liberate this child. I mean, they, they fall flat. Now, please remember earlier in our travels through Matthew, Jesus had sent out the disciples to do a little pre-missionary work. He had sent them out into the surrounding villages and the towns to spread the good news of the gospel, to preach the kingdom. Matthew chapter 10, we're told that accompanying their message was the ability to perform certain miracles, of which, you should note, was casting out demons. So at some point in time, the disciples, these men, have had a little practice at doing this. And now they're met with this need, likely because they had done this before. Hey, the disciples have done this. Maybe the, the man had heard that. And so he comes, he brings his boy, but they're, but they're unable. And so what does the man do? The man sees that Jesus has come back. He overlooks them. He goes straight to Jesus. You guys are not helping me at all. Maybe Jesus will. And you see his desperation, you see his humility. He comes, he kneels down, he lays prostrate before Jesus. And he says, Lord, have mercy. Not mercy on me, but please have mercy on my son. He's suffering. This is difficult. He falls often into the fire and into the water. He's like, I didn't want to buy, I brought him to the disciples. They couldn't do anything, so I'm here, I'm at your feet. Please, again, coming to the feet of Jesus. So Jesus, we're told that he answers the man in response to the, the, the revelation that the disciples couldn't cure the boy. Jesus says, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Now, Jesus is directing this not to the man himself. I think, and again, this is maybe a little liberty with the text, but he's speaking to these nine disciples. You're faithless. You're perverse. This word perverse, maybe a little strong in the way that it's translated into English. It's crooked. It's off. You guys have missed it. You're faithless and you've missed it. How long should I bear with you? How do you not get it by now? It's kind of what Jesus is, is implying. And then he turns back to the man because the man, he doesn't care about the disciples. He's desperate with this need. And so Jesus, he turns to the disciples. You guys are faithless. How long will I be with you? Jesus, by this point, you should note, is on his way to Jerusalem for Passover, which is where uh, you know, everything will take place. The week of passion will occur. Jesus' time with them is very short. He's like, you guys, come on, man. You don't get it. But then he turns back to the man, note, and he instructs the man, bring him, bring your son here to me. We're told, verse 18, that Jesus <coughs> rebuked the demon. So we know his physical ailments were the direct cause of demon possession. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples, they come to Jesus privately. And they said to him, why could we not cast the demon out? Now, we've had examples of, of Jesus liberating people from demon possession. We had several examples. This was part of Jesus' ministry. Time and time again, we see him demonstrating power over the dark forces in the world around us. What makes this story interesting is how the disciples are brought into this. Again, please note, at, at one point earlier in the ministry, these men have been sent out by Jesus, given authority to cast out demons. And then they're faced with this particular need in this particular moment, and they can't cast out the demon. And they fall flat. And Jesus rebukes them, and then he rebukes the demon, and he liberates the kid. So the man goes on, imagine that, you know. Imagine that. This man, he made the right decision, didn't he? Faced with a desperate dynamic, a, a child that's suffering, 
When all hope is lost and he's exhausted his resources, the man comes to Jesus and Jesus works and his kids like, have mercy, I will have mercy. And I will heal and I will liberate. For this man, that journey back home, wherever home happened to be, you can imagine he's praising the Lord. His heart is, is, is filled with glad tidings of great joy. Jesus has healed his only boy. But then the disciples come to Jesus, and their question here is sincere. It's honest. They're like, Jesus, what happened? Um, why could we not cast out the demon? We've done this before. We've had some practice, but it didn't work. In this moment, in this time, in this situation, we failed. Why? What's the explanation? Verse 20, so Jesus said to them, why could you not cast out the demon? Well, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Jesus, how, what happened? Why did we fail? Why were we unable? We saw the man. We saw his need. It wasn't as though we didn't have compassion. It wasn't as though that, that, that we were hardened. We wanted to. I mean, the implications of the text are they tried. They, they tried everything they could. They exhausted their resource, and yet they still failed. They didn't meet the need. So, Jesus, wh what happened here? And I think the key to understanding this text, understanding what took place, is this indication of unbelief. Now, so many pa pastors that teach this particular passage, at this point in a study, will go on a particular diatribe that I'm not going to because I completely reject the implication. As if they didn't believe enough in themselves to cast out, you know, the problem is, guys, is you guys didn't really think you could do it. You were faced with this need, you tried, but you didn't really believe you could do it because you really didn't believe, because you really didn't have faith that you could do it, it didn't happen. So the problem here, guys, is you guys and your faith and your ability to do it. You will hear pastors take this particular right turn at this juncture. I completely disagree. You see, ultimately, the problem here was that these men were faced with a need. And what did they fail to do? They failed to bring the need to the remedy, which was Jesus. Note, it wasn't the disciples that bring the man to Jesus. It wasn't the disciples that bring the boy to Jesus. It wasn't the disciples that were like, hey, let me introduce you to Jesus. He can solve this. Instead, they take this approach of like, we can do it, we've got it. Hey, we were, we were exercising demons before, we can do it now. The only reason they could exercise demons before was a unique instance of a little pre-practice because Jesus, again, go back to Matthew 10, gave them the authority for that season to do it. That doesn't mean that Jesus gave them authority in perpetuity. Instead, in this situation, this man comes to these disciples and the disciples are like, we got this. No, you don't. Jesus has this. When Jesus is like, it's your unbelief, it was that they had placed their faith in the wrong thing. Their ableness, their ability, their calling, their anointing. We're disciples. We should be able to do this when we do nothing apart from Jesus and apart from his power. The disciples should have done what the man did and bring the boy to Jesus. And at this point, it explains why Jesus, oh, faithless, oh, perverse, oh, how long have I how long is it going to take you to figure it out? I'm the one with the power. I'm the one with the authority. I'm the one that's able. You're not. Your job as my disciple is to redirect people to me. Again, I think church leadership often gets kind of this, the application of this passage wrong and how apt it is. You see, my job as a pastor isn't to fix your problem. My job as a pastor is to point you to the one who can fix your problem. It's to point you to Jesus. 
hey, I don't have the power to, to fix this situation. I don't have some great counsel or understanding to solve what seems to be insurmountable. But you know what? In desperation, right there with you, I know Jesus. And I'll bring you to Jesus. And we'll come to Jesus. And Jesus is able. When Jesus says, if you just had faith as a mustard seed, faith in what? You see, faith is only as good as the object in which the faith is placed. And our faith should be placed in our ability to solve other people's problems? No. It should be placed in Jesus' ability and his sovereignty and his ableness. If we would just take a bit of mustard seed of faith and say, hey, I don't know what to do here. But Jesus does. So let's together go to him and he'll solve the problem. The disciples don't. The man's like, you're worthless. I'll go to Jesus on my own. And, it, and it, the remedy is provided. Again, the solution to people's problems isn't you. You're the conduit to take them to Jesus. And the disciples are missing this. They'll get it. They'll understand it. But at this point, they're still, they're failing, which is good, because they needed to realize they couldn't do it. They had to bring people to Jesus. So Jesus is like, you're just, your faith is misplaced. It's your unbelief. And then verse 21, this is one of the most bizarre verses in all of Scripture, really. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, I, I need to do something I don't often do, and that's address some of the, the, some of the textual context here. Uh, the reason for that is that probably many of your more modern translations, I teach out of the New King James, it's because that's what I grew up with. It's what I'm familiar with, so that's why I teach out of it. Uh, but if you have the, uh, the ESV or the New Living Translation or even the NIV, if you have some of the more modern translations, you might not even have this verse recorded in your Bible. Uh, the reason for that is that there, there are um, scholars that will point out correctly, mind you, that a lot of the early manuscripts by which we determine these things exclude this particular verse. And so they leave it out because a lot of the early manuscripts uh, exclude it. Uh, there are early manuscripts, by the way, that, that do include it, but neither here nor there. The reason that the New King James ultimately decides to add this verse uh, here in Matthew's account is because Mark, uh, in Mark chapter 9, Mark includes this verse, and there's an ample amount of evidence uh, from the early manuscripts that it should be included. In fact, if you go to your more modern translations, they will include this verse in Mark's account, not Matthew's account. So the New King James made the determination, the translators, that because it's in one account, we'll, we'll add it to the other because there seems to be a little bit of debate. Regardless, what is interesting and worthy of note is that there are no translations of Mark's account that include fasting. None whatsoever. In fact, if you want to make the argument that this verse should be included in Matthew's account, I can go with you as long as you admit that and fasting should not be included. Because there seems to be very little, if not zero evidence of fasting. And fasting, by the way, is when this verse gets really wonky. This kind does not come out by prayer and fasting. Now, this kind, what, what is Jesus talking about? I did read one pastor that I thought had an interesting theory that he's talking about Again, the whole concept here is faith. He's talking about faith, their lack of faith. They're not putting their faith in the right, the right person, themselves and not Jesus. And that this kind of faith only comes by prayer. And that could make some sense, except for the fact that the word kind is really weird. It's literally genos, tribe, is how you could translate it, which gets really weird. Because Jesus is talking about a demon. He's like, hey, <laughs> this kind of demon. This tribe of demon. Well, this one only comes out by prayer. This, you kind of encountered a real, a real interesting demon. Now, before you're like, well, wait a second. Are you saying that there are different kinds of demons? Yes, I am, actually. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, you find a whole long list of what could be varying classifications of demons. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, darkness, it goes on this list of, of all the things that we wrestle about in the spiritual realm. And there could be different types and kinds of demons. I think Jesus is, is confirming that here. His point is that the only way that you can liberate somebody, the only rem that you need prayer. 
It's prayer. Now, again, take one step back. Is it the sense that we should be on our knees praying, Lord, give me the strength, give me the ability? No, we should be interceding, taking the person to Jesus. You know, prayer in its most basic definition is just our connection, our interactions in the spiritual realm. And Jesus is like, with this demon, you need to come to me, and you really need to come to me. I mean, you should be on your knees before me, praying, interceding, connecting, bringing that person as well. And I think that that's the best way for us, us to understand it. There are times, friend, you will encounter someone in desperation, in difficulty, in trial. You're not their savior. They already have one. His name is Jesus. And the accurate way of dealing with difficulty is we come to the Lord in prayer. And we bring them to the Lord in prayer. And we keep praying. The remedies are always Jesus. I love the fact that this, this interaction, like Jesus says, faith is a mustard seed. You know, he uses this idea of seed in describing our faith. Our faith in what? Our faith in Jesus. And a seed is an interesting, it's an interesting word a picture, you know, a, a mustard seed. It's a small seed. And yet what? Within the seed itself contains all of this, this mystery and magic and power to grow. A seed. You plant it in the soil. How crazy it is that a seed planted down into the earth just naturally knows which way is up. You know, let me think about it. And within that seed is all of the genetic composition all of the DNA that's required for, for the plant to grow. And all you got to do with a seed is just put it in good soil and give it water, and then it happens. It's not, it's not filled with effort and strife. It's natural. It's organic. It grows. Hey, your faith might begin as small as a mustard seed, but if it's in Jesus, it's in the right place. And the more that you root down by rivers of living water, and the more that you, you water that seed and nurture that seed, the more that seed grows and strengthens and yields. Now, verse 22, while they were staying in Galilee, likely Capernaum for the passage that will come next, Jesus said to them, again, the disciples, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. Now this is the second time in our travels through Matthew that Jesus has told his disciples of what was coming. Jesus has not concealed anything from them. He hasn't kept them in the dark. He's been very honest that the road ahead would be one of difficulty. What's interesting about this repeating of the same message is that we're given a little bit of a new detail, new wrinkle into how it would all happen. Again, comparing this to the earlier accounts of Jesus repeating similar ideas and concepts, what jumps to me is the idea that he says, this is all going to happen through betrayal. Son of man will be betrayed. That's the new wrinkle. Now, if you're the disciples and you're like, well, wait a second, betrayal? Who's going to betray him? Wait, this is all going to go down because of one of us? It's interesting. They get suspicious of each other. They grow sorrowful. Set that idea aside because in the next chapter, they start arguing about who's the greatest. You know, so these men have a little, little detachment from reality. At one point, Jesus is like, yeah, one of you guys is going to betray me. And as a result of your betrayal, I'm going to be killed. And then he says, I'll be raised up on the third day. Again, Jesus being completely honest as to what was happening, predicting it. Now, for those of you that might have any issues with the resurrection of Jesus, understand Jesus had no issues with the resurrection of Jesus. He staked his entire reputation on this one reality. That he would go to Jerusalem, he would be betrayed, he'd be executed, but three days later he'd be resurrected. Either Jesus rose from the dead, verifying he is who he says he is, or he didn't. But if he didn't understand the ramifications, it would make Jesus a false prophet, a liar. You can't have it both ways. 
Verse 24. I love this passage of Scripture, by the way. When they had come to Capernaum, <coughs> so they're in town, Jesus' headquarters, Capernaum. Peter lived there. Uh, no doubt Jesus probably stayed at Peter's. Anyway, they had come to Capernaum, and those who received the temple tax came to Peter, and they said, does your teacher not pay? The temple tax? And Peter answered and said, yes. Now, what in the world is happening? The temple tax, tax probably not being the best term to be used. It was the temple tribute. It's how the actual language gets translated. It was a tribute tax or tribute offering. What's interesting about the whole biblical notion and background of this particular offering is that you find its, its origins, its first mention, in Exodus chapter 30. And this was at the very beginning where God had given Moses the blueprints of the tabernacle, and they were getting all the artisans to make, you know, the table of showbread and the Ark of the Covenant and, and the walls of the tabernacle. Like, they were building it all out. And in and, and the process of how all this was happening, uh, God told Moses that there should be this tribute given to all of the men over the age of 20. All of the men of Israel. And this would fund, obviously, all of the, uh, the, the creation, the formation, the background. It would, it would bankroll the building of the tabernacle and what the priests would wear, etc. This, by the way, this tribute, what God told Moses, there is no mention of it being an institutionalized yearly tax. In fact, the, 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 it seems to have been a one-off type of a thing. Now, as things kind of developed and really the best we can tell, when the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity, like so many other traditions that developed under the rabbinical teachings, they started instituting this in a yearly format. Zerubbabel's t temple uh, needed uh, funding, and then later Herod's reconstruction of Zerubbabel's temple was so massive and costly that it also necessitated additional public funds. So we have this dynamic where by the time of Jesus, this temple tax was collected uh, yearly. Now, most often, it would be collected at Passover. Again, Jesus overturning the money changers, not only was that for uh, the scheme in rigging the sacrificial lambs, but it was also part of this temple tax, the tribute that you would give. It was basically half a shekel, about three days uh, wage for, for a typical man. So half a shekel. So you would go at Passover, you'd pay the tribute. It was this recognition of, of the temple, it's magistry, magistry. It, was, it was a holy thing, it was, but it was not mandated, and I guess that's the point. And so the men that collect the temple tax, because not everybody could necessarily get to, uh, get to Passover, they're in Capernaum, they come to Peter's house, they're like, hey Peter, what's the deal? Is Jesus paying his tax? And Peter kind of shoots off out the mouth like he often does. He says yes. Now, he probably says yes because Jesus paid the tribute in other years. They've been hanging out together for a while. So Peter doesn't think much of it. He's like, yeah, of course we pay it. No big deal. Now, Peter enters the house where Jesus is. And Jesus anticipated him, so Jesus knows what's going on. And so he said to Peter, he said, what do you think, Simon? I love the fact that he uses his Hebrew name here, you know, Simon. You're a good Jew, Simon. You're a good Jewish kosher boy. What do you think? Let me get your opinion. From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? And Peter said to him, well, from strangers. So Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. The exchange is interesting. Peter, yeah, 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 we pay it. Comes in. Let me ask you a question, Simon. Uh-oh, <laughs> you know. Let me ask you about taxes here. Tribute. Kings and, and do, do, do kings take tribute from sons? Or from strangers? Peter's, you know, well, I'm, you know, I'm glad we're getting to the point, Jesus, that you want my counsel, you know. About time you start asking me for advice. Things are progressing. 
But he thinks about it, you know, and he gives the answer, well, of course. You know, they would never ask from a son, but it would be from strangers. And Jesus is like, absolutely, the sons are free. So they want this tribute, and what is Jesus saying? He's saying, hey, I'm, I'm, you've already made this confession, remember? Chapter or two before. You've made this confession. Hey, Peter, who do, who do men say that I am? Oh, well, some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? Oh, well, again, glad you asked. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Very well. Good job, Peter. And so now with this tribute tax for the temple, what point is Jesus making? Peter, do you remember who I am? I'm the son of the king. Why do I need to pay tribute as the son of the king? The sons are free. So why would you say, yeah? Let's take my identity and start working it forward into my activity. So Peter gets it, of course. I shouldn't have said it. Now, this is what gets very interesting about this. Jesus continues. He says, nevertheless, lest we offend them. Who's them? These religious leaders that are collecting the tribute tax. Lest we offend them. This is what I want you to do, Peter. I want you to go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. And when you've opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. That word money, is, it's, it's the full shekel. It's the exact amount of money. You'll find a piece of money in the mouth. Take that and give it to them for me and you. <laughs> There's a lot of weird stuff about this that we kind of have to unpack here. First, no, you didn't fish like this. Like Peter is a fisherman by trade. And in the Sea of Galilee, you fish with nets. In fact, this is the only instance that we have about a hook, you know, recorded. You would take a net and go into the waters, and you would cast a net, or you pull a net behind the boat, hooking, hooking uh, you know, a, a line, throwing it in. This is, this is weird. In fact, Peter probably hasn't fished like this since he was a kid. Probably it, when he went to the shore with the hook and his little bobber, He's there with a bunch of children because this is how children would fish. Not a grown man who's a professional fisherman. So this, this is weird to start with. And not only that, the whole, the whole thing, there'll be a, don't cast a net so that, you know, well, I got 100 fish. Maybe one has swallowed a coin. No, no, no. Throw in your line the first fish. It's got exactly what we need in its mouth. Now this fish. How did it get the coin in its mouth? Not only that, why wouldn't it have dropped the coin out of its mouth when it opened its mouth to bite whatever Peter had on the hook? I mean, this fish is so holding onto its bling that it's willing to like tuck it to one side of the cheek to bite the lure. And, and then when he's being pulled out, he's still holding onto it. And imagine you're Peter and you're doing this and you open up the mouth and there's the coin. And you're like, well, there it is. Jesus has never performed a miracle dealing with money. Because you kind of like this. You're like, well, Jesus has this ability. I need my mortgage paid. Zach, I want you to go find the nearest cow. Tackle it. Open up its mouth. Your mortgage is right there. Like, would love for Jesus to provide in such a way should be noted, Jesus does provide, and he can provide however he wants to. If you're like, I don't see any way that he's going to provide for this, look at this story, you know? Jesus is going to provide, he can choose however he wants to. So Jesus has never performed a miracle dealing with money before. You also have to think, well, what about the other guys? Could it be that, that when we transition to them in chapter 18, talking about who's the greatest, Peter is like, Jesus is paying my bills with fish. What about you knuckleheads, you know? I mean, he's only paying Peter and him. What about the other guys? It could be that Peter's, Jesus is lodging with Peter. They're the only two present at this time. This, is, this miracle 
also interesting, worth noting, is only recorded here in Matthew. Uh, we have no record of this miracle any other place in the gospel records. Most notably, we don't have a mention of it by Mark. Now, why would you say Mark? Well, Mark, at least historically, we reckon, uh, gets his account from the perspective of Peter, that he was a bit of a protege with Peter, and so he's transcribing Peter's recollections. It's a good way to read uh, the Gospel of Mark, but this story's not included. Interesting. Of all the synoptic Gospels, this is the only mention of this. I should also point out another thing that makes this really weird. And maybe I'm going too deep. It's fine. This is the only miracle, the only miracle where there is no confirmation it happened. D did, you, did you miss that? Nevertheless, Peter, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast the hook, take the fish that comes up first. When you've opened its mouth, you'll find a piece of money that you may give it to them for me and you. And at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, chapter 18. You have no mention or confirmation of what happening. Of Peter going down to the shore and casting the hook. And every other miracle you have, every one, even when Jesus performs a miracle at a distance, you know, there will then be a passage at the end or a verse at the end that says, and that very hour the son or the servant was healed of whatever affliction that was happening. Every other time, even like Jesus turning the water into wine, the first miracle, interesting miracle, and we don't actually see the miracle take place, you know, there's no like particular account of it, and yet we have evidence why. Well, because they start pouring out what was water in the jugs, and people are like, this is the best wine we've had. Like, there's confirmation of the miracle. This is the only instance. What does that mean? I have no idea. I have not the slightest clue. If you can find a commentary that brings up the point, yet alone provides an explanation, bring them to me. Would love to hear it. I made several phone calls this week of pastors that I respect that have taught on this passage multiple times. They're like, I've never thought of that before. Now, it, here's kind of my, my thoughts on it. Because people will say, well, Jesus didn't want to offend them. Hey, what, what, Peter, what's with Jesus not paying the temple tribute? Oh, he pays it. He goes in, hey, aren't I the son? Why do I need to be paying that? You, you make a point, Jesus. Nevertheless, we don't want to offend them. So let me pay the tax in the most ludicrous way possible. To do what? To absolutely offend them. Like, can you imagine Peter coming out? Hey, hey, boys, he wants to pay it. Come with me. Where are we going? It's, it's a thing. But you're, you're going you're gonna to get your money. Um, I need to go get my tackle box. You, you got money in the tackle? No, I don't have money in the tackle box. I got to borrow my son's fishing rod, hook a lure. We're going down to the water. What are we doing? I'm, I'm getting you your money. First one's got money, you know. Opens its mouth and it's like, here you go. Like Jesus is making a point here that he's the son. And the idea of paying a tribute is redonkulous. It's not a real word, by the way. And so, and so what does he do? Oh, yeah, I don't want to offend them. Does Jesus actually pay it? Does Peter even pay it? A fish pays for the tribute. I don't need to do this. I'm the son. And the son is free. But I don't want to offend you guys. So I'm going to have my boy go do the most kind of offensive, craziest thing possible to pay you for what reason? So that you'd realize you're dealing with a son and not somebody else. Now, here's the interesting question. Does Peter even do it? We're not told that he does this. Now, I will say this unequivocally. If Peter indeed took the rod, went down to the shore, threw the lure, 
the first fish he caught would have had the shekel in his mouth, 100%. Why? Because Jesus said it. And what Jesus says happens. You can also make the argument that, that if Peter at this point like disobeys Jesus, that that would have been worthy of Matthew maybe telling us, you know, like filling us in on it. But why it just is left off? I, I think it's kind of Matthew being like, hey, yeah, this is ridiculous. And that's Jesus' point. So I'm just going to leave it here, move on. If you find a better explanation, let me know. I will say this. I think this is interesting, though. Jesus doesn't have to pay it, right? He doesn't have to pay it. Peter has to pay it. Jesus doesn't have to pay it. Peter has to pay it. Jesus paid a tax that he didn't have to pay and paid the tax Peter owed. That sound like anything? <laughs> like the essence of the gospel? That Jesus pays a tax that he doesn't owe, but in doing so pays ours as well. I mean, from that point forward, you, you would imagine this ruins fishing for Peter. <laughs> you know, actually, this is kind of a funny thought. I just had this. You know, after the resurrection, when all this stuff is going on, we find Peter back doing what? Fishing. It, could it have been that Peter's like, well, this whole Jesus thing, didn't not play out like I was thinking, and uh, I need to go make some money. Last time I went fishing, <laughs> maybe that's why the fish were so heavy. At that time, we can start into chapter 18. The disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Peter's like, of course it's me. Then Jesus called a little child to him and set the little child in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. One of the other accounts of this passage tell us that, that, that Jesus is, he gets involved here because of an argument that's taking place. Like these guys are, are having a powwow and a debate about who's the greatest. Now their understanding of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is that Jesus was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to lead a revolution, they saw this as a physical kingdom coming, and thus they were going to rule and reign with Jesus. Now, they're not totally off. It just doesn't happen at this time. It'll happen in a second time. But these guys are jockeying for positions in an actual kingdom. We're his lieutenants. I'll be a general. You know, you'll be in charge of this. You'll be in charge of that. Who's the right-hand guy? So they had this argument, which is really silly in the context that Jesus has just told them what was coming, you know? And yet they're still just jockeying for, for status, for position, for power, for influence. And so they, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's the question. And note, Jesus will answer that. But before he answers that, he makes it clear to them how they even get into the kingdom of heaven. Because they've missed that, haven't they? And so Jesus here, he says, okay, little child, come here. So he brings this little child, he sets this little child in front of them. And then he says, and you should underline this. He says, unless you are converted and become as little children. We're not talking about being greatest. You will by no means even enter the kingdom. Now that's heavy. I should note that in the tenses, unless you are converted and become as little children, we're speaking of something happening to you, not something that you do. Unless, it's not that you're converted, it's that you are converted. And that you become. Like Jesus is saying the kingdom requires a transformation of you knuckleheads. Right? And in order to enter the kingdom, 
Two things have to happen. You have to be converted. There has to be a, a, a decision of, of the mind, the will. A conversion has to occur. And then you have to become. And he uses this little child as an example. Little children. What is Jesus saying? By comparing really what sanctification's process is as, you know, children are absolutely dependent, aren't they? They're completely dependent, especially the smaller that they are. A newborn baby will die if it's not taken care of. By the way, so will an 11-year-old. They will die. They will watch TV all day, play with the Switch all day, and eat junk all day and die. Children are dependent for sustenance, for care, for instruction, for development, for education. Like every part of their life, for shelter, transportation. A child is completely dependent. And I think that there's an example to that in, in regards to what the conversion, what, when Jesus says, become like a little child. Like Jesus wants us to be completely dependent upon him for everything. For everything. And again, isn't this in, 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 its, in the flow of the text what they keep missing? You know, two different times we have the feeding of the five and then 4,000. Hey, you go give them something to eat. Oh, well, uh, d- uh, but, well this is all we got. Jesus is like, <laughs> okay, let's do it again. Hey, why don't you go give them something to eat? Uh, it, um, uh, it, uh, um, guys, have we not understood about the bread? I provide it. You come to me. Like, that's the whole goal here. When I say you do something, you come to me so that then you can do something. I'll bless it. I'll break it. I'll give it to you. You give it, you give it to them. That's how this works. And then we get to this story that we just looked at with the boy being healed, the dean of possession. They're like, we got this one. And they pff, fall flat. And the man's like, you guys are worthless. He comes to Jesus, and Jesus is like, well, faithless and perverse generation. Jesus' his whole point, he's just like, you guys need to realize it ain't about you. It's about me, and it's about you being dependent upon me and getting your instructions from me and being anointed by me. It's about me working in you, and then through you, you're just the vessel. You must be converted, and you must become like a little child. Dependency. I also think that there's this a simplicity to childhood that's essential for, for the kingdom. This little child, Jesus says, come. What did the child do? Came. Sit here. Sat here. The child completely obeys Jesus. Why am I coming here? Why am I sitting in such a place? Why are these guys here? No. It just obeys. Jesus says, come, and the, the kid comes. Sit, and the kid sits. Simple. Sometimes I think, I think as adults we complicate so much about life that shouldn't be complicated. To be converted and to follow Jesus, to be like a little child, to be dependent, and then to be simple. And then little children are not threatening. It's like the kingdom, it's an army of little children. The child is not threatening. The child is tender. To become a little child. To become a little child. Whoever humbles himself, uh, like the little child, is greatest in the kingdom. And whoever receives a little child in my name, receives me, which sets the stage for, for what comes next. To become... As little children. And there's so much. I mean, you can read Bible studies on that, the, the idea, the parallels. I think we get it. How, how does it happen? How do we do it? Because it's very easy at this point to, to, to start talking about all the things that we can do. Notice, Jesus doesn't say, act like little children. 
He says, this is converted and then become. How do we become? (laughs) No matter how old I get, my dad always sees me as a little child. It's so frustrating. I'm almost a 40-year-old man that I know how much to tip. There's, a, I, there's an app on my phone. But when you're around your dad, you're, you're a little child. It's okay. As, as a dad, I mean, Quincy will be 11 Christmas Eve, which blows my mind. But I see him and I still see that little guy. That's okay. When you hang out with your father, your heavenly father, don't come as an adolescent or as an adult know-it-all, but let daddy love his little child. And let him comfort his little child. And let him speak to his little child. I don't want to be treated like a little child. Well, then you have no part of the kingdom. We're to humble ourselves and come as little children. To our dad who loves us. Who has plans for us and good thoughts towards us. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give us a future and a hope. But it requires, requires humility. That letting go. That suspension of self. Lord, how do I become more like a little child? I hang out with my father more. And I embrace it. You know what my dad doesn't want from me? Advice. Because he knows it all. I have a heavenly father that knows it all. So Father, Lord, we just let that settle in.